All right, everybody. Today, we've got the president and CEO of the Florida Aquarium, Roger German. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Appreciate you doing this, man. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be able to talk about the aquarium, but Tampa and just fun stuff that's happening here, right? There's so much happening. And I feel like some of this more exciting stuff to me is some of the local stuff, right? Like the Florida Aquarium. I grew up going here. I saw the news about the expansion. It's super exciting. But I kind of want to start with your background and, and kind of where you grew up and how you got to the position you're in. So where are you from originally? So I am from the southwest side of Chicago. So south side pride all the way, you know, um, grew up in a blue collar family. Um, that's, you know, basically what the south side is. Um, mom was a public school teacher. Dad worked for the railroad. Um, yeah, it was, it was just a fun upbringing, but very blue collar. Uh, first kid in my dad's side to go to college. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it was cool. Went to the University of Illinois and been a very blessed life ever since. So that's I'm a awesome, hard, man. hard scrabble kid from Chicago. Chicago is a beautiful city. I've been there a couple of times. The first time was probably, I was in middle school, <clears throat> 15 or so. Oh, no. God, I'm old. Longer than that. <laughs> 18 years ago. Gorgeous town. I remember thinking at the time, I was only 12 or 13. Wow, this is a big city, but it's clean. Like, because I'd been to New York, I'd been to D.C., and I thought, whoa, this is a big city, but it's really, really nice and clean. Yeah. I think most, I think most people from what I talk to from around the world, uh, and definitely in, in, in the States, but definitely from around the world, what you typically will see is I think most people define Chicago as the quintessential American city, mm. right? Heart, Midwest, heart of the country, big city, uh, all the values. You get the New York melting pot, you know, which is, you know, really right. an epicenter of the world. You get your DC and your politics and LA and, you know, your Hollywood. But if you really were to say, like, what, what is the quintessential city, um, American city, I would say it's Chicago. And I think that really goes back to its roots, right? I mean, the biggest cool thing in Chicago uh, was what it sucked at the time, right? Was the Chicago fire, right? Burns the city right. down. But they had a chance to take an older city and rebuild it and learn from either their mistakes, which I think is super cool, as well as learn from others. And so um, that's kind of, uh, it's just the way you grow up. You realize, right? Besides Mrs. O'Leary's cow, it's like, how do you do things? And your cleanliness is really, I, I think, is attributed to something they learned um, and I'm not an architect and I'm not a des developer, so don't everybody <laughs> chime in, right? But um, putting alleys in, mm. you know, if you think about New York and, you know, if you're the East Coast, right, you don't have alleys, you built on top of each other. And every day you bring your garbage out to the front right. street. Chicago, after, you know, when they rebuilt it, you know, you put alleys. So all your garbage went in the back. And so the garbage man and you know, there's picked, a ton here in Tampa, too. A lot of people don't know that. And it's probably yeah. because they're all filled with like trash and old mattresses and they're overgrown. I that's an, that, that's an interesting point. Maybe a program to bring back the alleys. We have them here in Tampa. Tampa really was developed early on in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So we have some of those cool features in the city that other big cities around the country have. We just, I don't know, the way people live nowadays is not compatible to that old city, Chicago or New York lifestyle. Yeah. Maybe we'll bring it back one day. I think, we'll yeah, and it'd be interesting. I, I, I think you, what you're seeing here in Tampa today, and I know we're kind of jumping a little ahead, but I, I think that's exactly right. I think what you're building and what you're seeing here and, uh, uh, you know, this region uh, is, everybody says we want to leave, you know, New York or Chicago, the big city and a few things like that, but they're coming here and trying to build a little bit of that, right? right. As, as humans, we are, yeah. you know, we like to gather places as humans, there are certain things. And, you know, I look at something like uh, the other night I was, uh, you know, at a restaurant, uh, um, you know, over in Midtown and you just kind of look around. I mean, these mm -hmm. kind of areas that are being built up, um, I think are going to come back and they're going to be, yeah. you know, the wave of that future. You got less people driving, all that stuff. So, for sure, and the lifestyle that these new developments afford really is is more geared towards a walkable city, right? Mm -hmm. Like even Midtown, you wouldn't call that a suburban development, but it's certainly somewhere in between of like the dense downtown core and then out in like a gated community, right? It's in between yep. that. But you go there and everyone's on the street and it's really nice and manicured and there's shops and restaurants and then there's places to live above that. That yeah. style of development, I think, is extremely popular with my generation and younger. I mean, that's what we want. We yeah. want to go downstairs, go to the grocery, run our errands, and we don't want to get in a car and sit in traffic all day. Yeah, no, it's true. Well, it's one of those interesting uh, things that all of us as uh, business owners and leaders are probably grappling. And if you go out to the other side, I know this 
takes us down a different path, but no, okay. this remote, right? I mean, the remote work, right? right. And, and, and all of that too. And so what will be interesting is where we land somewhere, mm. because to your point, we're social, you know, humans and people are social, you know, creatures. And so you want to be together. So if you create your lifestyle around having people and restaurants and your cleaners and everything else in those, but then you have the opportunity for another social, you know, grouping, tribe, whatever, you know, is your work. And so it'll be interesting to see where that, where that shakes out and balances. So. Yeah. And I feel like places like the aquarium are a big part of that because, you know, when I was a kid, there really wasn't a whole lot in that area. I think the aquarium was built in the early 90s. Yeah, 1995 is when it opened. So it was being built, yes, in the early 90s. And so <clears throat> Channel Side, that kind of area down near the port, that used to just be warehouses, right? There wasn't a whole lot to walk to. But to your point today, you go to the aquarium, you can go and get lunch at Sparkman Wharf, and there's Channel Side, which is a residential neighborhood right next to it. I mean, it's kind of becoming more of an urban destination where you might go to the aquarium on the weekend with your family, but then while you're there, you're also eating out, maybe you're shopping, like there's more to do. It's not just this singular destination, it's spread out in this urban environment. I think the aquarium's a big part of that. Yeah, no, I, I, I will 100% agree. So I'll jump back real quick to Chicago for one second, because when you grow up there, you, when, wherever you grow up, you kind of take on like the history, right? The mm -hmm. DNA. And so when I mentioned earlier that, you know, the city had burned down and, you know, and, and was going to be, uh, you know, needed to be rebuilt. Well, what happened in the late 1800s was the city hosted the World's Fair. And out of the World's Fair, all of those business leaders, and I stress business leaders got together and they had created a vision. They said, if we want to keep this going, if we want to build a world-class city that competes with New York and Berlin and Paris, they all came here, they checked out this place, what do we do? And that's when they laid out a vision for Chicago. And they laid out the, you know, everything from the park system to the public transit system to cultural attractions. And that's how all of those you know, the Shedd Aquarium, the, you know, Field Museum, the uh, Art Institute, which is one of the, you know, top, you know, uh, uh, museums in the world. That's how they came about. And so when I fast forward to here, to your point, so the visionaries for the Florida Aquarium that put it in the location you mentioned, right, there wasn't a lot that was there, mm -hmm. was the vision of, of, of Bill Crown and Tom Hall, who's still very active here in Tampa. Um, it, it was a vision of them to say, look, we're, we're going to put this aquarium here and it's going to be an anchor. And everything you're seeing today is is really because of we took that chance we made that investment and let's see what happens it's a world-class city built and a neighborhood in this case built around a world-class aquarium what a vision that was to foresee in the future 30 years later and yeah. now only now it's really coming to fruition yeah yeah because it just started so i got here in uh, june of 17 and it had just really started breaking right before i got here but even when i would drive in None of the stuff in Water Street was even here six years ago, right? It's hard to believe that in the last five years for that downtown area. And then we talk about the other pockets around, you know, oh, the, yeah. you know the city. But yeah, I mean, it really it took a little while to, to, to make it happen. But uh, yeah, no, the, the aquarium was that catalyst that has sparked four, five, six billion dollars worth of investments. And now you see an Ebor, right? Amazing. You see Gasworks, you see others that are popping up. You know, if you really were to zero in, and I know we're looking at a few things, but mm -hmm. if you really zero in... The epicenter and the very first investment in culture, right? The, the, the arena opened up around the same time, and so did the convention center. But the aquarium really is that driver, um, and, uh, um, you know, we, we take pride in that. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that it's, it's really an area that – that area, that whole port area is interesting because – on one hand, you have the cruise ships, and there's so much industry on the other side of the port. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you have this huge push for residential urban living. So that's going to be interesting how that those two worlds don't necessarily mix. And I know the port has plans to develop that cruise ship area and build residential towers. I saw some crazy, I don't know, plans, some multi-billion dollar plans. So we'll see how it pans out. But I think there could be a good mix of industry commerce business while maintaining that cruise ship port aquarium and then all the other shops and restaurants you have it's just going to be interesting that in between period how all that i don't know buttons up there's always a transition right yeah oh absolutely but I, but I oh think there it is tyler right here you got yeah so that's what i'm talking about 45 oh yeah acre in the channel district yeah that was that was uh that was uh announced again before i got here um and that that plan actually believe it or not has uh, has been scrapped 
Um, I think the towers and a few other things weren't um, uh, um, able to be really truly realized. Um, but uh, look, the, the the city, the aquarium, the county, the port, others are you know keeping their eye to your point on on what's the right development. Uh, you know, for that area. And, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll figure it out over time. It's going to be, I think, a little wonky, but I hope that everybody, I know the aquarium has this, um, you know, look, we, we, we have a, um, a, a commitment to collaboration and really finding what works best. I think the big thing, though, and this is where I'll go back to, the big thing is, is going back to a little bit to Chicago, and I don't like to always reference, trust me, I'm, I'm here, Tampanian, <laughs> and do whatever. But it was those business leaders who stepped up and created a vision for the type of city they wanted. And mm. I think that's the next step for Tampa, honestly. I mean, I think what, Tampa's growth has been absolutely incredible. Um, there's a lot of champions. But one could probably look back and say, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of opportunistic and, you know, kind of weaving the quilt together. And right. that's not a bad thing, right? Because we've seen quilts where it's, you know, the patchwork, but you end up with this one giant quilt. Or do you create a quilt that is one seamless picture, mm. right? And what does that look like? And I think that's where you see a lot of the cities where they have the big vision of what's the next 20, 30 right. years look like. How do we get there? Um, and and grapple some of these really, really tough questions. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's a good point because you look at guys like Venick and Shaw, some of these developers that own 40, 50 plus acres, you know, they have a huge responsibility to create the Tampa of the future. Whereas in Chicago back then, you know, if you look at a map of Chicago, you have these massive parks and these huge boulevards. I mean, you know, fast forward to today, you almost wouldn't be able to create a city like that. You know, back then, I think people were were much more in tune with their city. The city was extremely important to gain international commerce and business people from all over the world, like you're saying. Whereas today, you have so many private property issues, and the idea that you could turn Tampa into Chicago is almost impossible. But what an opportunity this city has, Tampa, because look at all the vacant land and then the people that are involved really want to see this city grow, like Vinick and Shaw. Like, these guys are all in on Tampa, although I know Vinick just kind of released his shares in SVP. But, yeah, but you know, he started out with that massive vision and, and look at how well it's turned out. Yeah, no, I, I think that when we look back, history will be very kind. Um, you know, it already is, but very kind to Jeff and that vision. That's for sure. Um, I mean, you know, he obviously grew up in Boston. You know, he understood, you know, that that city center. He understood all of the things that make a world class city. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he drove both development, but really, you know, innovation, right? I mean, the wellness center, I mean, looking at it, the certification that way, looking at it differently, embracing the water. I mean, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, Duh, you know, right? those are all the stories I talk about, right? Even this, the, you know, what Sparkman Wharf is now when it used to be called something different, you know, it was concrete walls on the backside of the water and it yeah. was storefronts in the front and didn't, my understanding didn't really last very well. Um, so yeah, he is, he has not only, um, uh, there's probably very few people who could have done what Jeff did. And I, I know all of us will be owe a debt of gratitude to him now, but also really, truly down the road to see what was built here. Daryl's picked yeah. up, Daryl's picked up that right mm -hmm. now more recently, right? And he's trying to connect the, you know, the historic Ebor and really, really passionate about what's here. Um, and, and uh, probably bringing in not only building innovation development, but uh, I would say, um, you know, probably a stabilization for a while from mm. what I understand the history, right? Of Ebor up, down, up, down, up, yeah. down. Um, and it's, but it's so cool. I mean, it's one of That's those That's what makes that, it great. It does. I those, would agree. Those ups it's and cool. downs and the crazy history and, you know, the, the mafia history, the crime of Ebor in the 1920s and 30s. And it's all fascinating stuff. But the fact that it's still here today and the fact that you have a guy like Shaw that is willing to complement that history to a brand new development, it's amazing. That's what you need. That's what makes a city great. Absolutely. Well, yeah, because that's the key, right? You know, you, 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 when I came to the Florida Aquarium, you know, one of the things I wanted to remind everybody was, is that we are writing the next chapter of this beautiful book, mm. right? We're not, I'm not here to try to rewrite it. We had a lot of people in, in this day and age, right? And politics and other things, they're, they're always trying to rewrite rather than write a new chapter on mm. history. And so that's the way I look at it. It may be different or not, but uh, I think the same thing with Daryl, right? I mean, Daryl and Jeff and others, I mean, they are writing new chapters for the history of, of Tampa, right. especially downtown Tampa. Um, uh, and they're invested in the communities as well, but that's pretty cool to think about, right? They're not trying to rewrite, they're Trying to write it, the next chapter in the story, and yeah. who knows where it'll where it'll end. Right. 
How did you get involved in um, the aquarium? I mean, did you grow up interested in science and, and biology? <laughs> How did you find yourself there? <laughs> yeah, uh, um, most uh, college uh, professors don't like me to come and speak to the, the <laughs> incoming freshman class because I have a very nonlinear career path. So uh, as I said earlier, I grew up in the southwest side of Chicago and um, uh, you know, went to school. My degree is in journalism with a minor in political science. And so, yes, it's uh, very different. So, and I actually started working. My very first job was working in television. I worked at the ABC affiliate in Chicago and uh, worked on some pretty cool programs with some pretty cool people and moved out to Hollywood and oh, wow. spent a little bit of a year out there, came back, uh, stayed in TV, and then an opportunity came to, um, uh, you're kind of the... Uh, in the personal journey, right, when usually you're the first in, or if you're the last in, you're the first out, right? And so there was a lot of mergers in media and do whatever. I was like, oh, I'm, I can see the writing on the wall. I'm mm. the new kid on the block. So I jumped into uh, what I like to say, you know, state and city and county politics and government. And C-SPAN, that concept was just starting to break in the mid to late 90s. And so I um, had an opportunity to go work in government and uh, and which eventually in you know, Chicago is, uh, is the saying goes is, you know, good politics is good government. So they're intertwined very, uh, uh, very much so. And then in 2000, um, I was, I just got reconnected with the shed aquarium. Um, they had some beluga whales, uh, that were born, but the, you know, the calves weren't uh, you know, doing as well at the time. And so it was on the front page of the newspaper. And so I'm on the, you know, I'm in some political event and having another, you know, bad hors d'oeuvres, you know, and doing like, oh my gosh, man. And, and, uh, and I had happened to call, uh, the shed for, uh, for uh, some help with a field trip. My sister's a teacher and, uh, they said, oh, we're looking for somebody in communications and marketing. And if you know anybody, let us know. And I said, yeah, sure. I'll let you know. And, uh, lo and behold, it was like that evening I went looking in the mirror and it was like the V8 moment. Like I hit my head, you know, with, the, with your, your palm. And I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. Why would you not, you know, like apply for that? That's the coolest job ever. And, as they say, the rest is history. And so I joined Amazing. the Shed Aquarium in 2000. And, wow. the, and the joke is that the sharks at the Shed Aquarium do not bite as bad as the sharks in City Hall. So I was very, I, 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 my quality of life dramatically improved. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, said the, uh, uh, I said to my boss, the, the CEO, I said, I want to be you someday. Not because I want the title. It has nothing to do with that. But, you know, about six or eight months in, because I realized the mission and the and the impact that we could have going back to the history of why the place mm. of the aquarium was built and how it's a community asset how it is a you know a teaching you know institution how it can save you know wildlife and and ultimately all of us because we are so interconnected and so you know I was there for uh, nearly 17 years and then the opportunity happened to come down here and be a CEO and I knew my predecessor and predecessors um, you know, really well. And this was a really cool opportunity, not only to come to the aquarium, but to the stuff we talked about earlier, which is to be part of a city that is really, really just growing and dynamic mm -hmm. and, uh, and to kind of have influence in a way of not only creating the world's greatest aquarium, which we can talk about in a minute, but uh, also being part of the fabric of a city that is, you know, that you don't get a chance, as you said, to build. Right. So it's that's cool. funny what you said, like the creatures of City Hall are, you know, you know, they are <laughs> magnitudes worse than the creatures in the aquarium. And don't forget, we're talking about like, you know, 1999, 2000, right? It was a different blood sport today. Oh my <laughs> so, gosh, yeah. But we won't go down there. Um, so, so at the aquarium, it sounds yeah. like you were in charge of media communications. What exactly was your role initially when you joined? Yeah, when I initially joined, I was over over uh, communications, did some government affairs, um, and played in that space. And then over time, just eventually grew into executive vice president at the Shed Aquarium. Oh, so then oversaw you know multiple you know divisions from our largest conservation division with in the Great Lakes and. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, took on a whole bunch of stuff, was involved in, you know, designing, you know, exhibits and strategic plans. You were and there for a the long time too. Yeah. So you saw, I'm sure growth or maybe not. I don't yeah. really know the oh, history. Yeah. 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 When we started, when I started at the shed, so there was that, we definitely did some huge projects, you know, 80, hundred million dollar renovations, um, wow. uh, along those lines. But when I was at the shed, I started and it was, um, uh, we were about a $28 million operation. And uh, when I left, we were about a $60 million operation. So wow. we had a lot of growth there. Um, now, take that to here. When I started here, we were about a $21.5 million operation here at the Florida Aquarium when I started six years ago. Um, and right now we're 40. 
So um, we've we've done a lot here in the Florida Aquarium and kind of kind of using the uh, the roadmap, uh, you know, at the shed. Um, you know, I saw it. Matter of fact, it's interesting. Uh, he passed away a little earlier this year, but uh, my mentor and the former CEO of the Shed Aquarium, a guy named Ted Beatty, just I mean, he helped develop me. He was just a I mean, like a you know father figure in many ways, and on the uh, you know especially in the um, uh, the professional side of things. And um, but it was funny. I remember when I first got this call for the job, he said. How old are you? Just as, you know, and I said, I, let's see, what's him? Uh, I said, 54. Or no, 48. I said, 48. And he's like, what's the budget? And I said, it's 21 and a half million. And he started laughing. And he knew the answers, obviously. And he started laughing. I said, what? And he goes, when I joined the Shed Aquarium in 1994, I was 48 years old. The budget was $21 million. Wow. Right? And so he goes, you know the roadmap. You know how to build a world-class aquarium. Go do it. Go do it. I was it. like, wow. And so to see just kind of where we've come in the last six plus years. It's fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Fantastic. So you get to the Florida Aquarium. I'm sure that's an extremely exciting endeavor. I mean, being, you know, sitting in Chicago and, and executing this amazing vision up there. And now you're down here and you're the president and CEO and you get to oversee the vision here in Florida. Um, I wanted to ask you about aquariums in general. Is it public? Is it private? Is it is there a relationship with the government? Is it a is it a for profit company? Like how does that exactly work? Yeah, that's a great that is a great question. So I will say so. There's um, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is kind of the 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 uh, gold standard for um, associations. Uh, has 250 plus zoos and aquariums uh, across the country and in in some international um, uh, places. Um, I bring that up because I'm going to use that as the model. So there's about 48 or so aquariums uh, in the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Aquariums are different than zoos in many ways. They are they are much more, um, I would say, overwhelmingly nonprofit organizations. They have some, uh, you know, uh, they work closely with government entities, whether they're local government, like for instance, for here, you know, uh, you know, you work very closely with. Um, uh, Mayor Friedman and others to make sure that, you know, we had the spot, we can get everything going. But by, by and large, uh, majority of them are uh, non-for-profit organizations and they run themselves. Got it. Uh, there's a few for-profit ones. I mean, you know, here locally close by, you can, you know, you can see places like SeaWorld or you can go to other places that are, you know, more for-profit right. aquarium. Um, and, uh, but rarely are they run by, like really truly run by government where sometimes zoos you know, have more of that connection. They've been around longer than aquariums. Aquariums are more newer mm. in the concept. So, um, yeah, so we're a nonprofit aquarium here in, uh, you know, in Tampa. And, you know, everything from folks who spend their money to, you know, on things to folks who like to make donations to support our, pro, you know, our purpose and our programs are, we welcome. So is that, do you think that's more challenging to run an aquarium with that model or or is the SeaWorld model better in terms of funding and, and doing what you need to do as far as expansion goes? Like, would it be more advantageous to acquire capital as a regular business? So it, so non, so it's interesting, right? So the nonprofit world, if you really truly think about it, right, is probably more, I think if you're running an aquarium, zoo, same thing, but if you're running an aquarium, it's more of a, of a, of a um, designation, right? It's meaning, so... From my perspective, driving gate and making sure that portions of those, you know, that ticket that you buy or that, you know, salad or sandwich you buy or the plushie you buy all goes back into like what a for-profit would, would be invested back in the aquarium. Mm. And the difference is, is that we're able to grow philanthropy in a different way, right? So philanthropy mm -hmm. supports the organizations, which allows us to grow, but also have some different impacts. So I run it as a business, even though you may call it a nonprofit. It's, uh, you know, my background more like, again, in that marketing business space you have is, to. is different than, right, right? Than maybe somebody, yeah, absolutely. And the successful uh, aquariums across the country are really, because if you, t if you dissected the Florida Aquarium, and this is what's unique about organizations like ours, if you dissect it in some way, every one of those divisions could be its own entity, right? Like our learning education program could be a standalone, you know, Hillsborough County, you know, early childhood development, or I mean, like it could be one of those on its own, right? Our animal care program, our rescue rehab program could be like, you know, the Humane Society or whatever, rescuing, you know, animals. Right. Um, you take the experience that people come and visit, you know, that could be you know, the attraction side of the house. Then you take the conservation, which is, has, you know, PhDs and doctors and scientists, and, you know, they're doing these global research programs. 
but could be a university or could be something different. 100%. So, but when you pull them all together, you have to have that um, ability to pull them all together and think from a business. But yes, we're a nonprofit, and and uh, and like I said, now we're at forty million. Um, yeah, it's you amazing know, in six years. So it's pretty cool. And then that association, it, it, I mean, you mentioned forty eight. Is that like the Florida Aquarium, the Georgia Aquarium, Correct. the West Virginia Aquarium? I don't yep. know if they have one, but you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Is that kind of what it is? So each state has their own official. No, so it's, it's it's interesting. So again, I'll go back. It's I'll, the Florida Aquarium, you're right? Exactly right. And I'll go back to the uh, the forefathers of the Florida Aquarium. They named it uh, uh, perfectly, right? right? I mean, at the end of the day, so you have the Shed Aquarium in Chicago, right? Obviously named after the founder, the guy who wrote the check, John G. Shed. Uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the day. Um, you have the National Aquarium in Baltimore, you know, where a lot of people are like, oh, is that in D.C.? And it's just up the road, I know, but like, the na- oh, is that the National Aquarium? Oh, right. it's, it's really the aquarium in Baltimore. It's not symbolized as, you know, the United States Aquarium. And then you get others like us who, you know, that was like the Florida Aquarium. And so our goal is to try to, you know, uh, without us declaring it, but be seen as like the state's aquarium. You know, right. Georgia is the same way, but, you know, Georgia Aquarium, it just, it, it was probably more of a proximity of like, where do I go? Oh, you go to the Georgia Aquarium. But, you know, when they opened, they were the world's largest aquarium. Now they're the world's largest in the Western Hemisphere. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's sometimes those names and the branding helps. But uh, we want to grow into being, like, known as the state's right. aquarium. But, you know, we got a long way to go. Plus, we're collaborative, and I never want anybody to, you know, feel that we're stepping on their toes because, quite frankly, we work with a lot of the aquariums on oh, things I'm like sure. saving sea turtles and coral. I'm sure, and boat other marines an extremely helpful. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Resource we, with everything going on in the world, we need more people and more organizations to be do, stepping up than competition at that point. I'm about, again I'm about collaboration, not about competition. So, Florida, <clears throat> I would imagine there is a unique responsibility at the Florida Aquarium for education and conservation. It's not that Georgia wouldn't need the same thing, okay, but we live in such a coastal environment here in Florida. A lot of the animals that are in that aquarium, in fact, maybe most of them are found here native, right? Whereas Georgia, you know, you're bringing in whales and and different creatures from around the world. But Florida, I mean, you guys have a coral conservation program we're reading here. I'm sure there's, there's so much with conservation and knowledge, getting young people interested in, in marine biology. That's, that's extremely helpful. Do you guys have programs with universities, schools? I know I went there on a few field trips when I was younger, but walk me through kind of that that piece of it, that education piece. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if I, if I roll a little bit back up, I think I appreciate what you said. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have at the Florida Aquarium is to really connect with the local folks, um, you know, our neighbors, our friends, our family, the business community, and make sure they are aware of the unique role we play, right? Um, oftentimes, you know, the growth that's happened here, you know, has been about, you know, tourism and the economy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, look, everybody, everybody can help with that. But what you're talking about in the learning space, what you're talking about in the conservation space, we do so much more, and especially right here in our aquatic backyard. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, from the learning standpoint, yes, we, we, we work with, um, you know, uh, the Hillsborough County Public Schools, I mean, very closely with them. We have one of the best STEM programs in the country, if not, uh, especially that's focused on underserved, uh, you know, women and you know, young girls. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, hands down, but, you know, we're here in Tampa and you might not realize that, right? Uh, we work with, uh, you know, the universities. We work with, you know, we're starting to grow our programs more with USF, with UT, um, you know, we've had some partnerships with not only UF, but also down in Miami, especially when you talk about coral, you know, so we're this lab, we're this collaborator, um, and, uh, in, in the science and the marine science world and the animal rescue world, but we also have other programs, right? I mean, there's going to have to be a CEO someday and there's right. going to be a CFO and mm-hmm. there's going to have to be a teacher. And so, uh, we do a lot of those programs and then you put on, as we look, you know, a little bit at, at certain things, you know, like the, um, uh, you know, the conservation programs and coral and stuff. Mm-hmm. So the more folks know that we work every day tirelessly to protect the aquatic environment in our backyard and and how does that relate? First and foremost, I think when we came through this pandemic, we are way more connected than we than we want to believe, right? Nature, oh, yeah. animals, and humans, oh, yeah. but it's easy to forget, right? And so, what we're doing on those fronts, I mean, is really about our quality of life in many ways. And then, if you're, you know, cleaning up the bay, or you're, you know, you're, you know, reintroducing a sea turtle back, uh, you know, and 
and and you and I live here and we, you know you raise your families here you know it's what what are the things that show up on Instagram like oh I saw a sea turtle right mm-hmm. or I saw I, you know I saw a dolphin and stuff yeah. well they're only going to thrive in an area in an you know in an area that is uh, inhabitable and mm-hmm. so that's the role we play a lot too that sometimes that disconnect happens most what we've really focused on is trying to switch the branding paradigm mm-hmm. that we that the Florida Aquarium is not just this little attraction in the corner that we actually are a really truly important part play an important role in the quality of life of our community. And sometimes that's easy to gloss over in an economy that's super hot. And, you know, most of our growth has been based on development or, right. you know, our dollars. Well, that <clears throat> that public perception is so important because you don't want to be SeaWorld. You don't want to be this clearly for-profit um X, you know, they almost exploit sea creatures. There's there's documentaries about that. There, there's a lot out there about SeaWorld that has a very negative connotation. I feel like what the Florida Aquarium has done is the complete opposite of that. You're such a partner with the environment. I mean, many, many times I remember going there, the passion that some of the people that work there with the animals have for the animals, but also just for Florida, like... I think a lot of people understand, every native Floridian understands that if we don't have our, our beautiful water and beaches and palm trees and dolphins, and, and if we don't have our environment, we don't have the economy and the business that you mentioned, right? A lot of people come here for our gorgeous natural environment and our weather. If for whatever reason we were to disregard that and all that was to go away, your real estate's gone, your business is gone. I mean, if we live in a crappy environment, no, no one's huh? going to want to come here, right? And I think that a lot of that was put to the forefront during COVID. I remember walking up and down Bayshore during COVID and it seemed like the water was more clear and the air was, was fresher. And I think it connected a lot of people back to their environment during COVID. Everyone kind of took a chill pill. So you guys have done an amazing job in that. Um, and, you know, with, with education and getting young people involved is fantastic how what's kind of your guys's role in maintaining that positive public perception about conservation like do you guys put on conservation camps and i notice on the website you do clean up and you're cleaning up the beads for gasparilla right yeah. conservation camp as well yeah that's out on apollo beach so we have this comp- we have a 22 acre conservation campus with a partnership with uh, tico uh, it's a great partnership, and we work closely with uh, FWC, the Florida Wildlife Commission. <clears throat> and so we have our our uh, coral uh, research facility out there. We have a sea turtle, state of the art sea turtle rehabilitation center. Um, you know, there's a youth center out there. FWC runs, and you can you know you know take people out into the into the natural world and the mangroves, and it's it's super fun. It's, this it's is great. fantastic. Yeah, and so it, it, it's uh it's right just south of the Manatee Viewing Center that's been here for 50, 60 years that Tico operates and. Um, yeah, no, it's, it, it's exciting, but that's the role that we play. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. The, um, look, the way, the way that, I, that we approach a lot of this is, um, I've often said like, you know, we want to be the fun school teacher, right. Or, mm. you know, sometimes you go through these branding exercises and you're like, Oh, you're that kind of eco tourist that everybody loves, right. That you see on TV or TikTok and stuff. You know, that's the way we deliver conservation in many ways. I mean, conservation mm-hmm. should just be part of us, right? Sometimes it gets mm-hmm. politicized. Sometimes it becomes big C, little C, all of that. But, you know, you come to the Florida Aquarium, let's just say you visit, right? I mean, the, the reality of it is, is that you should have fun. You should learn something. Hopefully, <laughs> we've given you some ins- inspiration or some action items that there are little things you can do, right, to protect our backyard. Uh, and without, like, hitting you over the head, ultimately, at the right. end of the day, of going, oh, my gosh, if you do this, if you do that, right? So, for instance, when it comes to straws, you know, I mean, one of the things, you know, we don't have straws at the aquarium. We, you know, we sell metal straws. We encourage people. But just walking out, like, when I go to a restaurant and my kids will look and go, oh, save a sea turtle. You know, keep the straw today. And someone will say, that's all. You know, the, usually the wait staff will be like, that's awesome. But that's a fun way to do it. That's right. not like, right? I mean, it's not walking in and going, hey, why are you doing this? And do you know? Do you know? I mean, like, we shouldn't be that preachy. You can work it in. Um, and I think that's where, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more success uh, yeah. uh, just to get that message out. To me, that really would be the, the right way to incentivize people to maybe pick up that piece of trash on the beach or, or not litter, right? The love for nature, the love for these beautiful animals, these native animals we have here. Hey, maybe I'm not going to, you know, go to the beach and leave all my trash on the beach. I'll pick it up. I want to save the turtles, yeah. right? That, that love for nature keeps people 
you know, it, it keeps a happy environment. So I Absolutely. think that's super important. Well, and you, and you have the beads up on the screen here, right? I mean, it's two things. So one is our role, right, is in one way we feel is to is to roll up our sleeves and act. So we have divers, you know, after a Gasparilla parade and we have divers that go out and they clean, in, you know, in the water and they bring, uh, you know, the beads up and we give those over to the McDonald's uh, folks who, you know, repackage. And so you're putting people to work, you're, you know, cleaning the environment. So there's that, right? But the other part of the incentive to your point, so that picture right there in the pile that's there, mm -hmm. that's bring your beads in. And we're going to give you either free admission or some version of that, wow, right? Okay. So now you're asking folks with a reward, right? I mean, and so, you know, we don't have a mission statement anymore. We change it to a shared purpose. And the shared purpose is it's all of us, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people will go, oh, the aquarium, maybe the government will figure this out or do whatever in conservation. But it really is all of us, right? It's our, it's our aquatic backyard, as I like to say, the aquatic neighborhood. And what can we do? So we should be a driver of changing behavior. And that comes through a lot of positivity and... So you can bring in during that time and, you know, we're going to take care of you or otherwise we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to go clean it and do it. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice combination. It's fantastic. That's fun. You guys, yeah, I actually dove one of the uh, tanks at the aquarium. I Did don't you? know if you guys still do that anymore. This was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. No. So it's so interesting story, right? So we, so you, we go into COVID and, um, and uh, we, you know, we closed, we were the first aquarium in North America to reopen. So we were closed for eight weeks. And, uh, but the point here is I, 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 I talked with the team and I said, look, let's, let's not be like a bear and go into hibernation and just come back as the same business. This is an opportunity. Let's evaluate everything. So there was a group that split off and said, let's take care of the animals and let's take care of the building. And then there was another group that split off and said, well, let's rethink a lot of things. And so that dive program is one of the things we rethought. So Florida Aquarium was one of the first aquariums in the country to have a, a public facing dive program. You had to be PADI certified. 13 years old or older, all of the above, right? It's a great program. But when we but when we were coming out of it, we said, okay, well, let's let's figure out some things. And there was a there was another uh, a dive uh, program that was being explored, and it took us a little while because obviously we wanted to you know know more about the virus and so um, mm -hmm. with air breathing, it took us a little while. But we eventually got to the point where we had these two programs: mm -hmm. do we bring the current program back, or do we do this new program called Sea Trek, um, which is a dive helmet that goes on, and you may be able, oh, you've got it off in the corner here. Um, yeah. So how cool so, is that? Yeah. That's so awesome. so we were going back and forth, and 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 the only thing we said was, look. Why does the Florida Aquarium exist? Why do we have these four walls? Why do we care for the animals? And, and what do we do? And so the overarching message was, well, if we want to connect as many people to the underwater world, right? Don't we want to do that? And so the question then became, well, which program does that? So the Sea Trek program, you know, six years old or older, and you don't even have to know how to swim, and you can go wow, underwater. Six years older, older. Yeah, we we do ten at the aquarium, but that will, eventually we'll get down to six. But that's that's the program, and it's what an experience for a child to correct. go underwater like that at that young of an age. Wow, Absolutely. that would change their whole world. Okay, so even just your reaction is exactly how we looked at it, and we said, all right, fine. So we do have a dive program at the Florida Aquarium at Sea Trek. It's what you're seeing here with the helmets that go on, and uh, ten years old or older don't have to know how to swim. You go underwater with these animals, it's pretty amazing. But I'm gonna put one more piece on this because this is the other cool thing about the Sea Trek program that, um, that really, really helped. So coming from Chicago, I, you know, I, we dealt with a lot of this and we see it down here when I moved down here, right? There are certain communities that do not have a very healthy relationship with water. In fact, you hear a lot about drownings and other things that are you know, in, in, in underserved communities, communities of color. Um, and so, what we launched with this program, because it is, you don't have to know how to swim, the age is younger, and the fact that the helmet construction can break down other barriers. Um, in some cases, uh, the, the lack of, of uh, water time is, is about cultural things too, right? Um, and so we launched a program a year ago called the Community Sea Trek Program, and, and, and we, we run it ourselves for now. Um, and, uh, um, but once a month, we bring in upwards of eight to 10 kids for the most part. There's been some adults, but kids for the most part from underserved communities. And we let them go in and dive. Man. And I will tell you that when we launched it, uh, the mayor was with us and we launched it and there was these eight young African-American boys who were like, oh, we're going on a field trip. And they're like, nope, you're going in the water. And I didn't know how to swim in some many cases and do whatever. And those brave kids just, some of them took their time. It took mm -hmm. them a while to get down. And when they walked, they came up, 
uh, one of the kids took the helmet off and he said, well, this must be what Neil Armstrong felt like when he walked down the moon. Now think <laughs> about that for a minute, right? You and I, we can take that for granted. Right. But you know, here's a kid who- He really meant that. He really, oh, absolutely. Changed his life. Uh, yeah. You know, and I'm not saying that he have to change the life to be- you know, a marine biologist. I mean, that's sometimes you get caught up in that. Like, no, you changed a life. You show, you know, you may show a kid you can do anything you put your mind to, right? You may show a kid something different. And if you, at minimum, maybe he says, oh my God, that turtle that swam around or that shark, uh, you know, maybe I won't throw something. I mean, whatever right. it is, but you changed a life. And so this community program, once a month we do, we bring in kids, especially kids from across the Tampa uh, and the region who otherwise would never have this opportunity and just really, truly change lives. So what an amazing program. Yeah, it's cool. Even, even just the perspective shift from a young kid who lives in an underprivileged community that wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to experience something like that. And for them to be in that environment, gosh, what an eye opener for them. Yeah. Wow. That really does exist out there. It's not the street and the house and the, you know, my neighborhood that I live in, like, whoa, there's a whole world out there that I can explore. That's very important for children to understand. What a great program. Yeah. Man, you're right about switching from a dive program to Sea Trek. Sea Trek <laughs> is way better, man. This is awesome. <laughs> So, yeah. so what tank are you in here so when the, you do this? Yeah, so this one is in our heart of the sea tank. So if for, for folks who, who, who know the aquarium, you know, you make it about halfway down and you have the coral reef, uh, which has the big sharks and stuff like that too. Um, but then you kind of come around the corner. It's our second largest habitat. And um, yeah, you, you come into, come into the, the exhibit. You get to walk around. You get to walk under some caves. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's super cool uh, um, experience. And, uh, and, and later this year, you know, kind of, a you know, or next year in 24, we're going to, you know, change out a little bit of the animal collection there and, and can keep it going, right? Give, give, give experiences that most people won't be able to, to experience, which is cool. And what are you wearing here? You have on a helmet that has air circulating? Through correct. It? Correct. So they got the little pony tanks on the back. And, so you're, and you're not the, breathing pressurized air. You're not actually scuba diving. It's nothing like no, that. No. And yeah. And so, so think of the, con so you, so you are, so the tank, so you, there's two ways to do sea track, which we don't have the one, which is basically a hose that comes down and is tapped into you. And two is you can do the tank. So if you see everybody here, they have that little bottle right. kind of hanging on the backside. So that's like a scuba tank bottle, but it's, but it, it's not the, in your mouth, right? It's a pressurized, like, uh, so if you were in the bathtub or in a pool and you take a cup and you turn it over and then you go down, mm. that's the concept, right? So the gentleman who, who, who founded this and created this, their, their family had been in the history of developing, um, uh, uh, submarines for a long time and designing. And so this is kind of that concept, but yeah, it's, you're, you're in an air pocket and there's air being pumped in and, and, uh, yeah, it's super cool. Very safe for kids too. I mean, oh. I, I've, I'm, I've probably done, I've been a scuba diver maybe a few years. I haven't been that, you know, involved in it, but even a few times I've came up, I have sinus issues. I've had nosebleeds from scuba diving. So for yeah. children, this looks like an extremely safe endeavor, right? I mean, you're Absolutely. not really breathing. Correct. You don't have to work on like breath control necessarily. You don't yep. have to worry about rising up too fast. I mean, there's a lot that's involved in scuba diving for, I think the youngest you could be is 16. You really have to know what you're doing with this. Yes. You can just come on a field trip and check it out and you're ready to roll. Yeah. Anim animals are fed, taken care of, right? You're in a controlled <laughs> not, environment. There's no current sharks or anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Right. There's no currents to fight. Um, it's about 12 feet deep, right? So to your point, you don't have to worry about the pressurization. I think the biggest fear for, I mean, there's probably some pressure issues for a few folks, but I think the biggest one where there would be ever barriers, it, 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 the mind can't just grasp the concept, right? So that's why I always mm. say, look, if you're in the pool and you take it, or you're in a pool or you're in your bathtub and you take a cup and you yeah. go, remember that air bubble that's there? They're like, yes, once you get that across, but when you're going down and especially, you know, for some of these folks in the community who you know don't know how to swim and they have no relationship, you're like, wait, this is going to flood and I'm going to drown. And you're like, no, 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 no. And then the minute they go, down and down and down. And then once you get to the bottom uh, and they're like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, the water didn't come flooding in. I'm breathing. It's normal. It's not. Now they want to explore. They're probably uh, like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And the around. turtle and the sharks that. come up and check them out and stuff like that too. Now it's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. But that's, but you know, look, my, uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about and um, uh, from my particular perspective is my parents raised me to say, look, to whom much is given, much is required. Right. And so, you know, we're at a, we're at a place at the Florida Aquarium where again, my belief that I think aligns with where we're going is we should be a cultural asset. We should be uh, a, a civic and a community asset and a leader. And so to, we've turned outward, we've turned, you know, our four, you know, the four walls, we make sure that, you know, you come to the aquarium and you're going to have fun. You're, you can unplug from the world. 
You can connect with nature like you've never connected before. You can create those family memories, whether it's, you know, seeing, uh, uh, you know, Santa over the holidays and throwing snowballs or whether it's just, you know, coming on a spring break, you know, and things like that. But the other part of that is in the, in the to whom much is given, much is required factor, we've turned outward. So we mm. make sure that we do things like we are in communities you oh, know, yeah. with cleanups, right? We are doing science and research that we are, uh, you know, making sure, you know, a lot, you know, first responders and others, you know, have access to the aquarium through programs that we have, you know, to, to, to be a community leader and asset, right? Um, I mean, the natural contribution from economy is there too, but, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's an important role that we play. So when I find programs like this that are meaningful um, and can change some lives, I mean, why would we not want to do that? Fantastic name too, Sea Trek. Sounds like yeah. some cool adventure you're about to go on, which you are. You are perfectly right. named. I agree. Um, my grandfather always said downtown was like everyone's backyard, no matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what neighborhood in Tampa you live in, but downtown is like everyone's backyard, right? It has all the amenities you would expect in, on your own property. I feel like the aquarium complements that so well, you know, yeah. people that people that think about that, right? Like if you don't know how to swim, you could go underwater and interact with rays and sharks and uh, sea turtles. I mean, what a, what a, that's a perfect explanation of, Hey, everyone's welcome. Even yeah. if you can't swim, you know? Absolutely. Um, what other, it sounds like COVID was a shift, a really like a paradigm shift for you guys. What other programs or, or ideas came out of COVID? Yeah, I think that I, I, what we did is we really looked at our uh, uh, and said, look, we don't want to be, I shouldn't say don't, um, you know, it, it's, we need to evolve from being what I think most people thought was an attraction to a conservation based aquarium, right? Mm -hmm. That we have a purpose, we have a shared purpose, uh, and we move forward. So I think, you know, what, what came out of there, uh, you know, w w was some, 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 uh, um, uh, gr all growth, right, by the way. So, you know, how do we engage with students more? Um, you know, we're about to talk about a, a partnership at some point here um, where we can hit every fifth grader in Hillsborough County, right? Where before it's like, hey, come on down for a field trip like you, uh, you took here and I took in my, you know, where I grew up. Um, but how do we go into the community? So it really, you know, allowed us to look at it differently that way. How do we create new experiences? And, you know, one of the things that we haven't really leaned into is this $45 million, $40, $45 million expansion and renovation. Uh, but how do we bring new experiences to, um, you know, to, to the Florida Aquarium and to our neighborhood, right, to our community? Um, it, it allowed, because we hadn't done that. Matter of fact, this is the first real, you know, large animal-centric expansion since we opened in 95. So mm. the fact that we're able to do that, right? So, but when we sat back and said, what do we need to do? Um, that was key. We grew all of our conservation programs. I mean, we had, we had global breakthroughs in coral restoration. And, wow. you know, uh, uh, earlier this summer, we had Ginger Z from Good Morning America come with our team. And, you know, where they're talking about all the, the, the really, really hot waters down in the Keys and they dove and are like, oh my gosh, like all these plantings were dying and just get motivated us more, right? It hits punches you in the gut, but it motivates. So we grew conservation programs. We made sure our learning programs, you know, were outside of our four walls, even more so we were doubling down on, you know, our commitment to community, uh, you know, at the end of the day, and we're in a position where we can expand and we can, you know, contribute in different ways, uh, both from the economic standpoint of bringing new exhibits to life, but also telling conservation stories. Um, sea lions is one of the story, you know, the animals that we're going to bring in and will be open up late 2025, early 26. And people go, Oh, I see lions and things like that. But well, here's what's interesting. So sea lions have a lot of the same conservation issues as the manatees do in Florida, but it's hard to, you know, to get close and cuddly with a manatee. They're very much protected, but, you know, you can come up and maybe get a kiss from a sea lion. You can see a charismatic sea lion. And so our, our responsibility is even when we have animals that you can't necessarily find in Florida, they all have this intertwined conservation story and that inspire people to care about the environment. And our role will be to tell those stories, mm -hmm. you know, to make those connections. Right. Um, you're seeing up here, the, the axolotl up here, we just opened up our the first uh, exhibit as part of our uh, expansion, which is uh, called Morphed. Um, and uh, thanks to the folks at PAR, who are our new presenting sponsors, um, the, uh, you know, it, it brings the oddities and, and it, to the world and talks about how animals have adapted over time, but taking it to a whole nother level, um, you know, people are inspired. They're like, oh my gosh, like that's a real animal right. or not, right? And say, yeah, but whether it's that or the, you know, the common fish in our backyard, I mean, we, we play a role. And so um, we're creating, 
you know, we're, we're still building upon and creating the world-class aquarium that a world-class city deserves. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's exciting. There's such a deep connection when you can actually interact with an animal, touch it, be around it versus, hey, it's behind a cage or it's behind a glass, you know, aquarium wall. You know, it's like having having the ability to hold a creature and examine it up close. That's a special connection you get with a creature. I- Absolutely. Well, even some of our exhibits where if you don't actually physically get to touch, you may smell the salt water, right? You may hear the crashing waves, right? Yeah. And so to your point, right, it's it's dealing with all of the senses because, you know, it's uh, you care about things that, to your point, are tangible, right? Mm-hmm. That, that you have some connection with. And so you have to, so that's our goal. Our goal is to make those connections uh, in the four walls or out in the community at a way where people, um, you know, again, care about the environment, care about our natural world, care about ourselves really, truly at the end of the day. I remember as a kid, there was a touch tank right in the lobby of the Florida Aquarium. Um, I was there, I think the last time I was at the aquarium maybe was two or three years ago. I don't remember it being the same. Did you guys get rid of the touch tank? No. So it's, we changed it. Um, so yes, it's not the same. You're exactly right. So uh, many years ago, there was either some rays, depending on when you came, or some sharks, some small sharks that were in there. And so what we did is we redid it and it's called moon Bay right now. Okay. And so you can now touch a jelly, uh, oh. a sea jelly, um, you know, and there's this, uh, art feature, uh, uh that, uh, that is kind of the, the, um, the focal point, the circle sphere, uh, exhibit. And then that back wall that you probably somewhat remember was a more static back wall. And, yes. um, it's now video so you can see it. Yeah. And yeah, oh, so if you look at different. that, yeah, wow. so it's totally, yeah. If you pull Man. that up, so see how we did. So you still have Fantastic. a touch component, but you have the ability to touch jellies. Number one, to kind of break that down. And two is, um, you know, brings art and concepts in. And then that it's a video wall on the backside, uh, which is super cool. So just look, we probably put about 20 since I've been there, probably about 20 million at least in refurbishing, refurbishing the organization, gorgeous. right? Make, making sure that it's, you know, it's, it's more, uh, you know, uh, modernized, make sure that it is clean, it is a fun environment, and that now we can focus on the expansion to things like sea lions and penguins and puffins and all kinds of fun stuff. Was there an issue with touching the rays and the sharks versus obviously a jelly, I think is a little bit less, um, I don't know, can, can be touched, right? Yeah, no, it, uh, actually, you know, wasn't necessarily an issue because you can still touch stingrays, you know, up on the second floor right. at the Florida Corn. We moved those up. But what we thought was, and this goes again to what are those inspirational pieces? And so mm. there's only one other organization, maybe two in North America where you can touch a jelly. And so what are you taught all of your life, right? If you want to debunk myths, right? It's like, hey, no, you know, if you see a jelly, run away and do it, which you do, but I don't do, by the way, right? But you know, rather than having a visceral reaction and just being able to walk away or, you know, some people will be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, take care of that jelly and do everything. It's like, no, no, wait, you know, come and check these out. So these are moon, moon jellies that um, it's very rare to have an ability to touch. Um, but yeah, you can touch one of these. And so that's where the inspiration cool. piece comes, right? Because, you know, I always say that the Florida Aquarium, uh, probably when we started to your point, it's very much Florida centric, you know, I call it the noun, right? But mm-hmm. we're kind of changing it to the, well, I'll say the verb or the adjective, which is, you know, the Florida aquarium being maybe more of the state's aquarium, a few other things. But how do you inspire people? And one of the things that we found is especially locals, right? If if you're not always innovating, if you're not changing, if you're not having these stories or these animals that connect, at some point you just take it for granted, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, that's the aquarium. It hasn't changed in a while or, right. you know, so, you know, uh, well, this is a Saturday I was going to go, but oh man, 72 degrees. So I'm going to go to the beach instead. And then obviously fine four or five years you haven't been there. Right. So, you know, it's our goal. If we want to really tell the conservation story, if we really want to get people part of our shared purpose, one of the best ways to do that is to, you know, have a visit and have you come and we can have a conversation with you. Well, in many cases, when you can see some of the animals, you know, in your backyard or you're on a boat, I mean, it's, you know, look, there's boats everywhere in Tampa, right? I can see a shark in the wild. Why do I? So, you know, it's incumbent upon us to always make sure that we are innovative, that we are connecting people and that, uh, you know, the reality of it is, is that uh, uh, ultimately at the end of the day, we all care and we, uh, we do things. So, yeah, this moon bay is really cool. And these jellyfish are unbelievable. They're so alien. You yeah. Know? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Without question. And now, these are the kind that don't harm you at all, obviously. Right. I mean, correct. You can even touch the bottom tentacles, the yep. whole thing. Yeah. These are, they, they have, so moon jellies are found in cold water. 
uh, and they have less of any of that stinging, uh, you know, component to them uh, from that standpoint. And, mm. you know, they're a little more hardy, right? So you can touch, as you see, with the two fingers. And, you know, we have staff that's there to make sure, you know, that they, you know, they're all taken care of. But, yeah, no, it's pretty cool to be able to, again, debunk some of the, the thinking out there, but also have people care and connect. Well, there's a lot of them here in Florida too. A lot, you know, they wash up on the beach and it's important to understand, Hey, you know, if it, if it looks a certain way, don't touch it. If it's a moon jelly, maybe you can little, take a little, <laughs> take a little gander at it and give it yep. a little touch. But it sounds like they're not native to this area if it's cold water. Not, yeah. Not, not the ones that we have here. Yeah. These, these are definitely the cold water ones. Um, but what's interesting too, right? So what's the other story you tell? So we can have you touch, you know, a jelly, we can have you learn about them. Uh, but you, as you said, right, there are jellies that are here that are native. And if you really look at them move around and we have a sea turtle rescue rehabilitation program, I mean, one of the biggest issues is plastics. Um, mm-hmm. And so if I were to throw a plastic bag in the water and I were to see one of these jellies or a jelly that's native here and they look exactly the same to a turtle, right? And so it is one of those things where why touch programs like this and being able to tell folks like, look, that's why it's important. This is number one, you touch this animal that you didn't think you could, but two is how are we intertwined? You know, make sure again that, you know, in a positive way, right? You know, your, your trash could be, you know, mean something different to an animal who doesn't know the difference. Um, and oftentimes when we are rescuing sea turtles, uh, we are finding that, um, uh, you know, a lot of plastic bags, especially, right, are one of the big issues. Some of the people that work at the aquarium, I've always found, I kind of mentioned this, I think, before we went live, but they're so passionate about what they do. And I think whenever someone is extremely passionate about something and excited about it, it almost makes you, the observer, feel excited about whatever they're talking about. How do you find these amazing people to work at the aquarium that share these experiences with your guests? You know, it's a good, it's, it's, it's probably like anything, right? It's a, it's a, it's a push and a pull, right? I mean, we, you know, we, we look for good people, um, and, uh, you know, we try to recruit and attract good people. Um, but also if we live our shared purpose, as I like to say every day and people see that, then I think the other side is you have a lot of folks who knock on your door, right? And come, I mean, it's, right. if I look at my, if I look at my, uh, you know, my senior team, uh, across the board, I've got folks who, uh, re, you know, that, that have been here for a while that, you know, that have re- retained when I walked in the door. I have folks that I've recruited and I have others who've called and said, I want to be part of what you're doing. And yeah. can, you know, if you have an opening or an opportunity. And so we see that up and down uh, across the board. We also look, uh, you know, culture and shared purpose and how we uh, approach uh our role and responsibility, I think, is, you know, is really, really important. We are pushing the envelope on total compensation, you know, across the country. Mm. You know, we want to be a top leader. We want to make sure our people are taken care of. I mean, we're a nonprofit, but, you know, making sure they're taken care of. And, you know, we're, we're, we're ahead of the game in a lot of that um, uh, space. If you have a purpose and we celebrate our purpose, you know, people feel connected um, and, and they're willing to, you know, do some pretty cool things. So, And everyone, of course, wants to be a part of something that's expanding and, and growing. And let's talk about this amazing yeah. expansion. Um, so was this always on the horizon as soon as you got to the aquarium? Was there always like this expansion in the future that you knew about? Or is this a new thing that's kind of developed in the last couple of years? So it's kind of a little bit of both, right? So the aquarium itself, uh, from my predecessors and from, you know, the boards, you know, have all looked to say, look, we, you know, I mean, they all have had the same passion, right? Build, you know, keep, keep building the greatest aquarium ever, right? Um, uh, they may not have always been in the position to do certain things, uh, but there always was an eye on the prize to, you know, try to grow, try to expand. Um, hadn't been able to do much of that. And over the last few years, like I said, I mean, to be able to go um, from 21 and a half million to 40 million, right? In a pretty short period of time, that allowed us to really then say, hey, everybody's been talking about it for a while, but now we can do it. Mm. Um, so, so again, I think it's always been, you know, what, what can we, where can we grow? Where can the aquarium go? Um, but maybe the timing wasn't right or, or some other factors, but right now it's, there's no barriers in front of us. And Amazing. so, so then we were able to regroup during, you know, kind of coming out of COVID and regroup and put together a, uh, you know, really robust plan and said, let's go. Um, you put the stake in the ground and the flag in the ground and say, here we go. And that's really where, you know, more recently, um, I would see, it's funny because the, 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 uh, we had a press conference in January of 2020 prior to, um, uh, COVID saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to start doing some things. And it's interesting to see what, um, if I go back and look at those old renderings of how much we were not doing some of those things and yeah. COVID, you know, kicked in and now we're doing bigger things. 
uh, in a different way. Let's talk about the specifically the expansion and yep. what is planned and kind of how it's, like you said, shifted over the last few years. So what was kind of the original idea for the expansion and then how has that you know, evolved into what you are building today? Yeah, so, so the aquarium where we sit um, you know, we've got a, a terminal to, we've got a port terminal to our, um, to our uh, west um, in between us and Sparkman Wharf. And then we have a parking lot and a terminal to our north. Um, so the footprint uh, for any kind of expanding the footprint beyond kind of the four walls slash the on-site property, um, you know, is a little limited for the moment. Um, but I always say the moment. And so what we ended up doing was we said, look, where can we do a really significant expansion in our current footprint? And so that really was the starting point, mm. right? That's what drove us to think about it. So we talked about Morphed a little bit earlier. That opened up in uh, July of this year. What that did was that, uh, and you can see the kind of up top, what that did is that took a ballroom space that we had that was probably underutilized at the end of the day, as, as well as the fact that the market here is, is changed a ton, right? right? So everybody downtown and Armature Works and others are all. So what we decided to do was, well, let's convert that, you know, 10,000 square feet into an exhibit space because it gives us something new. And so that's the first part of the $40 million expansion was converting current space. The second uh, phase, which will slowly start happening over the next year and a half, uh, we'll do two things. So one is uh, what we found from guests is when you're on the second floor and you come out of stingrays, you kind of almost go back into a lobby and they're like, wait, what? Where do I go? What do I do? So that's good. We're going to call it, we call it, uh, we're going to gallerize it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so that will become more of a gallery experience where now you will follow a journey and a path. Um, that will be so new exhibits um, and new experiences that will be part of that. And the anchor of that one will be a two, two story puffin exhibit. So puffins aren't in Florida and you know, haven't been. And so, um, that will be an iconic, uh, uh, exhibit, but again, in current indoor space that we'll be able to, uh, to, uh, um, convert. And then lastly, what we'll do is the outdoor plaza, you know, the outdoor plaza right now has, you know, a playground, it has a, a deck in the back, it has, uh, you know, a splash pad, uh, that's there. That's all going to go away and be converted into a very large, beautiful, um, uh, uh, as you can see some of the pictures of a, uh, you know, kind of a Pacific Northwest, you know, South African, because wow. penguins will be out there, uh, concept. And it will be Amazing. all integrated and we'll have sea lions and we'll bring our penguins out so we can be part of more conservation programs. Um, and it'll convert that whole outdoor space, then lean into you know, uh, the, kind of the river walk area and a few other areas. So, um, but it's big, it's bold. It's, um, you know, it's going to change the way people see the Florida aquarium, uh, in many ways. So I saw Daryl Shaw was somehow involved. What is chair. his role? He's the chair. Yeah. So he's the chair of the cap of the capital campaign committee. So Daryl has been a huge, um, again, he, he cares about this community, right? right. And, and, uh, and with uh, aligning with his previous life a little bit in the, uh, 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 Blue Pearl veterinary. So he cares about animals from mm -hmm. South Africa. Um, and so, yeah, when, when we talked with him, he's like, absolutely, I'm going to step up. So he's the chair of our, uh, of our capital campaign to raise, you know, 40, $45 million. Amazing. What yeah. an exciting endeavor this is. I love this outdoor project. You mentioned the river walk is the plan for the river walk to kind of extend where the cruise ships are around the aquarium. I think there's a lot of conversations around that. Obviously something a little bit over the last year or so has been, can you open up the area behind terminal two? Right. Um, along those lines, uh, the port put together a working group, um, which we sat on and, uh, came up with a few concepts, but, uh, you know, the, there's gotta be more conversation, um, right. about what that looks like. Um, I think not only just by terminal two, but again, to your point, does you go north? What does that really look like? But that's yeah. where the big, that's where the city, I think, not city, but business leader, city, port, aquarium, others, you know, I think just, you know, hopefully sit down and, and have a bigger vision of, of what our, what we want our downtown to look like. Yeah. Right. That's and then map that out. That's a complicated spot, right? Because you do have <laughs> Cruise ships parked right there. There's obviously security and safety issues. Then you have port property. Then there's like city area. Then yeah. you guys, the aquariums right there. That's kind of a complicated, that elbow right there is tricky. But are you guys at the table saying like, yes, let's do that. That'd be great. Maybe even an entrance off the river walk on that side. Yeah, I think, uh, we, yeah, so uh, so collectively, um, I, look, there's, I think there's two ways to approach it. One is 
what are some things you can do in the short term, right? And so I think that goes to your conversation, right? Are there some short term things we can do where, you know, we activate or we do some things? Sure. Right. Um, I think all of us will find some kind of compromise and solution. Uh, uh, I shouldn't say compromise. All of us will find some collaboration and some solution to it, right, mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Uh, I think the bigger thing, right, the bigger conversation that, you know, that I think uh, many of us, including the aquarium, hope to have, right, is what is really true, the, the long-term vision for the, all of that area. Channel District's going to keep building, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, when I got here, I said the Florida Aquarium's going to, you know, it's a march to a million. We are about 800,000 guests. And um at some point, I will announce, right, where if you hit that million mark, right, ultimately at the end of the day. But if you really think about it, um, if I do, I said this at, uh, um, uh, at a recent uh, panel I sat on, and I said, if you really think about that, right, the downtown Tampa area does not really have a public transportation uh, concept like in some of the bigger cities. And so if you go, if I go from 800,000 people to a million people who walk, and I just do simple, I call it Southside Chicago math. And I say that proudly for all my Southside Chicagoans, right? Southside. So if I go up 200,000 guests, and I say the average party is four, that's 50,000 more cars just on those streets without public transportation, right? So, so you have that. The Channel District's building up. You know, there's the cruise industry. Like, there's all of these things that are there. And so... I think there, you know, the, I think our hope and our belief is we need to have a bigger conversation that is more long term of mm. how everybody, you know, what's the kind of city we want, what's the right balance for, you know, from businesses to residents to, you know, everything in between, um, you know, how do you make that happen? I, I would also say that if I go back to the Chicago concept, which is when everybody left from the World's Fair, they all sat back and said, well, what makes a world class city? Right. And, and I would, and a lot of these business leaders put their money towards cultural attractions. So we are a big cultural attraction oh, yeah. in a corner, right? That has helped drive all of this uh, 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 um, kind of growth and development. Um, we see ourselves as a very important anchor, but a neighbor. And this is where the transition needs to change to more quality of life, work, life, and play. Mm. Because I think for the longest time, the, the, the thinking for the Florida Aquarium is, oh, it's just a tourist economic driver. Well, that's a role we play, but is that what a world-class city, right, just only focuses on and all the things we do? I mean, one of the, one of the things that we want to look at the expansion and, and growing outside of our four walls is if I think of the, I always use the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago or what most people will know as the Central Park Zoo concept, mm-hmm. right? Central Park Zoo concept is the Central Park Zoo is in the middle of not only Central Park, but is in the middle of neighborhoods and it contributes to the quality of life. And I would argue that the values of the Upper West Side, values of the Upper East Side are like, well, we sit on our balcony and we can hear a lion roar and do whatever. The aquarium can serve that role in mm-hmm. the, both not only water, but but the channel district, right? And so, you know, we, we've talked about, can we redo the outdoors? Can we bring some animals outside that you, know, you don't even have to pay to go in, but you see, but it's really for the neighbors, right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, how do we become a neighborhood asset besides an economic driver, a learning institution, a scientific institution, right? all of the above? And so you're going to see more and more of that. My hope is just, again, the bigger conversations can happen of, how do we map out what the downtown area should look like? Right. Make some tough decisions, you know, yeah. um, and some right decisions. But at the end of the day, looking back 25 years from now, what should it look like and reverse engineer it? Yeah, because everyone wants to grow, right? The cruise ships want more passengers. Obviously, the aquarium wants, you know, everyone in the area to come and enjoy it. Sparkman Wharf, they need to sell food, right? So it's everyone yeah. wants more traffic. And how do you kind of solve that equation in that pocket right there? Absolutely. Well, and and right, and, and let's not forget those residents, right? Ultimately, at the right. end of the day, I know the downtown partnership did a uh, survey uh, a few months back, right? And it was like 93% of, of residents and businesses in the downtown area, you know, would like to see some type of, you know, development and access to the waterfront. And if you, you know, and it was about the river walk at that time of expansion up to, but we can figure it out. Um, I think that we just got to get everybody in the room mm-hmm. and, and, and really just think again about not short term, because you can make little decisions short term. And as we were talking earlier, right, you got these little pockets of who owns what and do whatever. But right. what's a holistic approach? And if the city is willing to do that, and I don't mean a city like the mayor, I mean, like, as these leaders are willing to sit down, I think the sky's the limit for, yeah. Tampa, for, for Tampa. I think that if, you know, the, the, the fear is that we all, you know, still stay a little <clears throat> parochial and stuff like that, that, you know, it's going to work, but... Um, 
just we'll see where we go. We will see where we go. I think the sky's the limit too. I think that's a perfect way to put it. There's there's so much that could happen and and will happen here. How it'll all get there remains to be seen. But I think yeah. everyone's on the same page. Yeah. No. And look, it's part of the reason I came here. That's opportunity, right? People yeah. say, why did you? I mean, look, my wife and I and our and our two kids. You know, we left a really amazing job I and, mean, you know, connected, you know, in for, for a third largest city. For a long time. Yeah, too. Absolutely. We knew, you know, we knew lots of folks, but we uprooted our family to come here for a couple of reasons. One, we, uh, we love the Florida Aquarium. We knew the potential and what we can do when we're starting to realize that. I think the second part, again, goes back to that DNA or what you learn is we knew what was happening in this city and the fact that we can contribute to, you know, creating you know, a city that we're all proud of and, and, a, and a city that, you know, you know, and may not be maybe in our kids lifetime, right, where the world looks and says, OK, yeah. right, you know, that that is cool. Right. And not just, oh, we made time. At, you know, there, there's a lot of momentum here and that's great. So you have to build on the momentum, but you can never get complacent. Right. On the momentum and the success. At least right. I, I don't. That doesn't drive me. Right. I'm, I don't like to be complacent on the success that we've had. Uh, Lou, I had some friends who played at Notre Dame for football and Lou Holtz used to always tell them, he said, look, you score a touchdown, you hand the football to the referee. You act like you've been there before. So don't get like the goofy celebration. You get on the sideline and what's next. Right. Right. And that's kind of the drive that I have. And it's just saying, look, great momentum, great momentum. But let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Because, you know, life is short. And at the end of the day, when we look back, I would like to know that we left it all on the table for the greater good of the community, the city, and the world, not the greater good of our bottom line, not the greater good of just, oh, look at the Florida court. Like, that's not what, that doesn't motivate me at all. Yeah. You know, I got, we, we, our whole entire staff, when you talked about earlier, our staff has lofty goals of doing everything we can, laying it out on the table every day. Yeah. I think the city of Tampa and the aquarium is lucky to have you. Oh, you're very kind. You're very kind. I love what I do. And I appreciate you doing the show too. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I think it's been almost an hour and a half. We said an hour. Oh gosh. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I could probably go all day with you. You're a fascinating guy. And your vision is incredible, not only for the aquarium, but for the city. I love that, that it's not all about the aquarium for you really at all. It's, it's clearly much more broad for you. It's, it's about the city and the community and the environment and Florida as a whole. And then Obviously, you're, the aquarium here is at the forefront to, yeah. for everyone to enjoy and experience. Um, what is the timeline on the expansion here? What are we looking at in terms of project progress and completion? Yeah, so you'll see a couple of f- refreshing updates over the next year in 2024. I think by the end of 24 calendar year, you'll see that gallery be uh, come online, the one we talked about mm. on the second floor. I think early of 2025, you'll see the two-story puffin exhibit, which will be a game changer. Uh, and then just because of you know either supply chain issues or a few things in construction, I would say late 25 is probably a pretty good space to say that that bow is done and that outdoor sea lion exhibit and penguin exhibit uh, will be completed and opened. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so you're really talking like, you know, the next two and a half years, we'll complete all this on time, on budget, and, you know, and, uh, and it'll be an exciting time. Fantastic. Well, if anyone's interested in visiting the aquarium, if you haven't already, definitely do so. The website is not floridaaquarium.com. It's flaquarium.org. Someone else owns floridaaquarium.com. Did you see that? Do they really? Something like that. I don't know. They're trying to sell it. Maybe they're holding you guys hostage. I have have no idea what's (laughs) happening there. But flaquarium.org. Um, I'm assuming Florida Aquariums on social, Instagram, all that sort of stuff to follow along. Absolutely. And then you, Mr. Roger, do you, are you on social at all active? I am active on LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> so you can type in Roger German and Florida Aquarium and you can find me on LinkedIn. I backed off on all of the other stuff. Probably a good move. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Well, listen, I appreciate your time, man. Thanks. It's great to be here. All right. Thanks. Bye everybody.